once your kids get to be high schoolers and beyond, obviously there's not as much in terms of caregiving duties, right? You're not buckling car seats and brushing teeth and all of that. The big need for high schoolers is connectedness. And so you've got to prioritize emotional connection with them, which means making sure that you are physically present with them. The people created through sperm and egg donation are talking to the people that chose for their parent to be missing. So that means that these kids very often have to process, suffer, and grieve alone. And I think that's at the heart of the diminished outcomes for that group of people. Adults need to do hard things on behalf of children instead of insisting that children do hard things on behalf of adults. So adoption is an institution that actually is absolutely set up around insisting that adults do hard things so the needs of children are met. Now what you've got is the um, emergence of like reproductive apps that will allow you to say, uh, this is what I'm after, right? I want a known donor, or I want an unknown donor. I want somebody who's willing to be involved. I want somebody that has nothing to do with the child. And so you can create all these different arrangements. Hi, Hi Katie. Great to see you. So are you home and back on California yeah, time? California time. Um, we're two states above, but really the whole left coast. Same, same time. time, same culture, whatever. <laughs> And did you have a good trip to England? I had a great trip. It was intense. It was so good. First of all, like I am like an information junkie. Like I, I might need an intervention in terms of like podcast consumption. <laughs> and so to be in a room with, you know, John Anderson, Jordan Peterson, Bjorn Longberg, and everybody else and all the other people that maybe don't have as much name recognition, but you get into a conversation with them and you're like, you could save the world. You know, like every person there was, it was so great. So I loved it. And especially because when I take the big five personality test, I am a 100% for extrovert. So it's just social crack. The whole thing was fantastic. Yeah. 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 I could see you cross the way when I came in to listen and you're just on fire sitting there. Well, <laughs> That's I am. Fun. It's amazing to be included in a group of people who are virtuous, mm. not saying sinless, but virtuous, and seeking to serve the world through bringing good ideas back to the public square. It's just thrilling. And it's such an honor to be counted among them. You know what I mean? And just to, to sit there and glean from their wisdom. So I love it. Sure, I felt that way just sitting there. You know, it was interesting. I had been in a podcast just minutes mm -hmm. before. And we were talking about family and we came into the room and you guys were discussing family. It was like, I just turned around and was talking about the same thing. But then with, I don't know how many people were there it had to be a dozen people anyway, at least a dozen people and uh, being very thoughtful and talking through the issues. So that was very cool. Um, we're going to talk about your book, them before us. I know you've talked about this book, multiple times to different people, but it's a very important subject. And something that I've been doing on my podcast is trying to talk about feminine, divine feminine issues. And family, of course, is at the center of all of that. And so even, even if I'm going to talk about all the trouble there is in the world and all the miscommunication, uh, which we can also talk about I want to also talk about what it means to have a family and uh, a family that is functional and that that uh, nourishes the children mm -hmm. and so that's what we're there that's that's really what I'm interested in is showing talking to uh, having you talk to my guests about what make what makes why why we need families and how important they are we don't think that they're very important in our society because the narrative these days is that you have to have a career if you're going to have a fulfilling mm -hmm. life that has become and it's no wonder you know i mean women were at home for centuries having babies and all of a sudden they got a chance to go out and work so it was no wonder that we maybe we jumped too far in that direction, but now it's been 60 years since the, since the birth control pill. 
and it's time to reflect seriously, right? Yeah. And I've really enjoyed your guests. I've really enjoyed your guests oh, yeah. and your conversations that you're having because you have the same thoughtfulness and seeking in terms of precision of your language as Jordan Peterson, which is great. Obviously, there's there's some marital rubbing off that's taken place. But I love the distinctly feminine aspect of your um, platform. So I'm honored to be among them. And I've really, really benefited from a lot of the other conversations you've had. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, well, I didn't know I'd like doing this as much as I do. I really like doing this. I'm, I've always been good one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I was a massage therapist. It's always been one-on-one -on -one for me. And so it, this isn't one-on-one. -on -one. This is one-to-one -one among the many. Mm -hmm. But, well, as I'm learning, when I'm on stage with Jordan, you speak to one person at a time. So you're always speaking to one person at a time. That way you're speaking to everyone mm -hmm. personally. And uh, I don't know, this is a... The podcast is, a, I think, an amazing way for people to tune in, yeah. right? And tune in and understand what the conversation's about. I wanted to start with rights, natural rights. You started with that in your book and talked about rights and what it means for children's rights or parental rights or adult rights. I I'd like you to just expound on that. Well, first of all, I guess you should tell people who you are mm -hmm. and what you've been doing and how long you've been doing it. And then I'll ask that first yeah. question. I uh, I told everybody when I was in London, I said, 10 years ago, I wasn't doing any of this. I wasn't doing any of this. Like at my heart, I'm a shepherdess. Like, I just want to bear your burden. I want to seek the Lord with you. I want to lift your face to God. I want to walk alongside you on the, uh, you know, the big five. I am like a 87 on agreeableness or something like, I just want to get along. I just want to love you. <laughs> and um, no matter where you are and what's going on in your life. Um, and so it takes a pretty psycho culture to turn me into a culture warrior. Uh, but that's kind of where we are today. Like I started writing about why marriage is a matter of justice for children when we first started debating gay marriage, because what I heard the other side doing in terms of pushing their policy agenda was talking about mothers and fathers as if they were optional in the life of children um, and saying, you know, kids don't care if they have two moms or two dads. Um, but what that functionally means is kids don't care if they've lost their mom or dad. And I've been working with kids for a couple decades um, through youth ministry. Um, I used to work at the largest Chinese adoption agency in the world. I've got four kids. One of them is adopted now. Um, I still run the youth ministry at our church. I mean, I think that one of the greatest lies is saying kids don't care if they've lost their mom and dad. What I've heard over the course of these last several decades is a child who is not well loved by their mother or father, that actually is one of the greatest wounds, often a lifelong wound that kids experience, you know? So that is what pushed me over the edge um, was this weaponization of child loss and pain um, to advance a political narrative. So I just started writing on an anonymous blog um, and that eventually turned into forming a nonprofit called Them Before Us, which could formally advocate on behalf of the rights of children to be known and loved by both their mother and father in areas of the personal and the political. You know, we, we talk a lot about how we are here to change hearts, which is like, helping people see things from the child's perspective, but also change laws. Like there's all kinds of terrible legislation being proposed state by state and country by country. And generally because children can't hire lobbyists or submit amicus briefs, their interests are not represented. It's really just a dogfight among adults in terms of satisfying what adults want. And so we seek to try to give kids a voice um, in those policy discussions as well. So that's what we do. We look at every marriage and family issue through the lens of what about the child? When you say we, what do you mean we? Everybody that's involved at them before us, right? Our staff, our board members, the people that write for us, um, the materials that we put out through our partnerships. And um, that's our goal is taking the focus off of adults and 
putting the focus on children. Like we want to put them, the children before us, the adults, because typically the way (laughs) marriage and family policy decisions go, whether that's cultural, political, or technological, it is all obsessively driven by what adults want. And very often it violates the rights and well-being of children in the process. So we, what we try to do is we try to elevate and prioritize the rights and well-being of children. And then insist that all adults, single, married, gay, straight, fertile, and infertile, conform to those rights. Mm -hmm. So the children come first. Right. So most of these, these are all people who aspire to have children, or are these people who have children? Are you saying that work with us? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Largely the people that work with us, uh, well, no, I shouldn't say largely. We've got it all. I feel like we are like a ragtag group of people who have sought to live these principles. So, um, we've got our, 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 um, board is overpopulated with adoptive parents, people who have sought to do the hard thing on behalf of children who have lost their mother or father through tragedy. Um, We've got people at all levels of our organization who experience same-sex attraction, right? Who identified as gay or lesbian at some point, but then said, you know, I'm not going to create my family around my sexual attractions. I'm going to create my family in a way that honors children's rights to be known and loved by both mother and father. Um, We have people who are products of divorce, um, people who have been adults in divorce and and experienced the injustice of a unilateral divorce. We've got children who were conceived through reproductive technologies who are um, speaking up, advocating, writing for us. Um, We have kids that were raised with same-sex parents who um, can talk about the mother hunger or father hunger that they experienced. So we've got it all. We've We've got people who were raised in an intact biological family who said, how could, how could I have swapped out either my mom or my dad and had no impact on my development or identity? So we've got it all. Um, in terms of our supporters across the globe, um, we've got Muslims, Christians, Catholics, um, several Latter-day Saints uh, contingents and partners. Um, we've got atheists. Um, we've got people across at least four different continents um, because the, the reality is that the nature of the child is the same, no matter where you are, no matter what God you worship, no matter what kind of family you come from, the reality of the child doesn't change. Children come from a man and woman. They benefit from being raised by that man and woman. That man and woman grants them the biological identity that helps them answer the question, who am I? Defending children's rights to that man and woman will automatically grant children the complementary benefits of mothering and fathering. So these are true regardless of whether you're grow- whether you're in Namibia, whether you are in Indiana, um, whether you lived 2,000 years ago, whether you're going to live 2,000 years from now, right? The, the realities of the child don't change who they are, what they need, and what they have a right to. The question is, are adults going to honor and acknowledge those fundamental realities, or are they going to disregard and violate those fundamental realities? Mm -hmm. And I guess we're having more complicated, as time goes by, we're having more complicated conversations because of technology Mm -hmm. as well. As technology changes, then there's more options of, uh, how you can conceive and bear a child. So that, that has got to be a huge conversation that we would, we can get to later uh, in the conversation, but yeah, it, these are, I guess this is taking up all your time. How do you have time to be a mother? (laughs) I get up at (laughs) four 30 Um, Uh (laughs) I do a lot of work before they wake up. Um, and then I schedule everything that matters, right? Schedule time with every kid. And then, um, I actually just wrote a second book 
that's coming out in September. That's sort of my parenting philosophy. Um, and mm -hmm. most of our kids are, all of our kids are teenagers and our real goal, like once your kids get to be high schoolers and beyond, um, obviously there's not as much in terms of caregiving duties, right? You're not buckling car seats and brushing teeth and all of that. Um, the big need for high schoolers is connectedness. Um, and so yeah. you've got to prioritize mm -hmm. emotional connection with them, which means making sure that you are physically present with them. Um, so mm -hmm. my husband and I both have little hacks um, to make sure that we're getting physical proximity with them so that we can have emotional proximity with them. Um, but the good news is like my kids are awesome and great self managers. So there's an, you know, I'm not packing anybody's lunch anymore. And that frees me up for a little more activism. So. Right, 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 right. I can remember when my son was in high school and then his time was his own really, because he was off to school every day. And when he came home was really mm -hmm. apt to him. Uh, I, we had a dog at that time, which was helpful because I would walk the dog when he left for school in the morning, when he was on his way to the bus and on the way to the bus, he might tell me what his plans were that day. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, that was uh, a ritual that we had and it really was, wasn't was pre-thought out. It, it developed as the need developed. And that's part of, I think, being present with your kids, it's being present enough to have relationship and, and uh, mm -hmm. attention evolve as is necessary. You can't plan ahead for these things because you don't know what's going to happen next, right? That That is actually exactly right. And we might get there in this conversation, but one of the we spend chapter five talking about the harms of divorce on children. And one of the greatest harms mm -hmm. is in the best case scenario, they lose 50% access with both parents. And I don't know about you guys out there, but I need 100% access to my kids so that amidst that 100% of daily interaction, sometimes 5% of the time, it ends up spontaneously coming up that they say, this situation happened in class and it made me really uncomfortable and I'm not sure what to do with it right? You don't schedule. I mean, if you're seeing your kids on the weekend, you're like, okay, here's our window to talk about important things. I mean, you are drastically narrowing the window when you are going to be available for the kinds of conversations that spontaneously arise with teens. I mean, how many of you guys who are listening, especially that have teenagers that say, hey, what, what big things are going on in your life? Your kids go, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. They will they will decide when to talk with you about the big things. And it's usually not the time when you've scheduled it in. You know, they will it will be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just when you happen to be in the car driving them to practice, or when you happen to be sitting on their bed with them as they're going to sleep or whatever, when they say, Hey, I've got a question for you and, and I'm not even sure if I should ask this. That's when you drop everything mm -hmm. and you say, I am all ears. Let me know what I can do. And so one of the great tragedies of divorce is those naturally arising conversations have a much smaller window to take place. And what that means is kids tend to put their burdens somewhere else. Have you talked to, have you talked to divorced parents about strategies to deal with that? Do you have any strategies well, to deal with that? Mainly that you have to be very purposeful Right. And, and the hard thing is that sometimes it's not up to the divorced parents. Sometimes it's up to whatever court arrangement has been made for them. Um, and so obviously you can be you can do what you can to minimize the barriers for the time that you do have together. I think that that's really what you what you can do is there's a bazillion barriers that keep kids from talking to their parents. And we are, my next book is called Raising Conservative Kids in a Woke City. <laughs> and it's really about like, how do you pass on your values when everything is against you? And we talk about how this, it's always been hard for parents and teens, especially to connect, but this culture makes it even harder because the culture is telling the kids that you are the enemy. So we've got lots of tactics for how to decrease the barriers between conversation with you and your child. Um, and so I would say that for the divorced, any parents, but 
the parent that has less time with their child by nature of a court decree, um, there's things that you can do to make sure that the child loves bringing difficult things to you, right? That's really what you can do is condition your child to associate you with relief um, and the lifting of burdens when they have conversations with you that are challenging, confusing, or maybe even self-incriminating. So that's what I'd say because they're, unfortunately, a lot of these poor mothers and fathers, especially the ones that have been divorced against their will, don't have control over how often they get to see their child. So they just have to make sure that there is no other emotional barriers when they are with their child. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's something that I've practiced later in my life, not so much when my kids were young, but now and with the public life now too, it's really important because you're meeting people all the time and you meet them whenever. So it doesn't matter what you're doing or what you need to do. You have to be present. And this is something that's been very interesting to travel with Jordan because he's at least he's a hundred percent in agreeableness mm. for sure. And so when he meets someone on the street, we might be late for a flight. He still stops, shakes their hand, asks them their name and how they are and how things have been for them and why they want to talk to him. And he's, you know, and it's, it blows me away all the time, just how present he is. And that's the, I think the trick, or at least one of the tricks is that when you have, I mean, it's the same thing just in a, in a marriage, but with children, if you have other things you want to discuss, you're not going to connect. And part of, part of not needing to talk about those other things is taking the time to talk about them when the time is right mm -hmm. and not bottling them up, but make, making sure that if you have something to say that you find a time to say it where you're not too uh, emotionally charged. So it is, doesn't just come blurting out at an inappropriate moment, yeah. right? And so I think when you have something like a teenager where they are their own person now and they're off in the world and maybe the time that they spend with you isn't number one anymore. And so you, you have to find those times where you make it number one so that when the when the time comes that they turn to you for that really intimate time that you're just there and uh that takes uh mm -hmm. commitment that takes commitment and uh that takes mm -hmm. practice yeah practice mm -hmm. and commitment that's exactly. what i think anyway oh you're, what do you think you're exactly yeah. right it, it's for me it is recognizing, especially, especially in the high school window, um, that if they ask me for something, uh, not things, if they ask me for attention, mm -hmm. I give it to them. Mm -hmm. And whenever possible, I reorient my schedule so they can have it. So like my second daughter and I, she likes to go to the gym. Um, and so if she asks me to go to the gym, even if I had a work project that I was going to do, I say, yes, we're going. And it's hard for me to say yes, because my to-do list is very long. It's very hard for me to stop what I'm mm -hmm. doing and say yes. Um, my third child, um, when he says, hey, can you drive me to school? And that means we stop and we get him a Starbucks. We go early. We sit in the car together and talk before he goes in. Um, if I'm not on for carpool duty with kid number four, um, I say yes. It's hard for me to say yes because I have so much to do. But that is, it's like what you said, you are committing. Where are you going to give your attention? That is the question. And for teenagers, mm -hmm. the answer must be, I will give you my attention when you ask for it. Not, I mean, we schedule time with our teens as well so that we can have consistent time with them. But when they ask for it, we say yes. And that is hard. I mean, I, I, it's hard for me. I bet it's hard for everybody that's listening here because everybody's busy doing meaningful things and and work that is demanding and a whole bunch of other relationships and and community commitments i would just encourage you that with teenagers the answer is always yes they always get the priority and you would rearrange your schedule for those moments when they're asking for it what do you think about you know the the times that you say you do schedule those times and those times 
happen at the same time every mm-hmm. week, yep. right? Yeah. And so that that consistency, if you are there, I think at the same time every week to offer your mm-hmm. attention, that's mm-hmm. what you're offering is your attention, then that's when those thoughts that they want to share, if it's been mm-hmm. successful, right, then those those things are going to come up again. And I don't have any research that backs this idea up, but I think that that's positive feedback. You know, you want to give, you want it to be a, a, a nourishing experience so that the memory of that, of that time and that activity is of a, a, a good, it's good. So that the next time they come up, then there aren't these barriers thinking, oh my goodness, like last time this didn't go well. I don't know if I can talk about this now. You know, you, so you want to set up something regular. That's why that walk with the dog was so good because it was, well, I was walking the dog. So it wasn't that I was with my son so much. I had something else to do, but really I was there to walk with him and he knew that I am. If I asked him, I've never asked him. I'll have to ask him. He knew that I imagine, but I tell you every time I said goodbye to him at the bus stop, I was grateful because you know, you don't have that many moments right. together. Mm-hmm. Once they get older like that, they're almost out there in the world and it's wonderful, but it's also the hardest part for a mother. And you want to be able to say that you put in the time that you have, you put in the time, even if it's just, you know, that time that you scheduled, even that, to be present for that. That's a good thing. I bet I have a question here. I did. I wrote down some things that I wanted to talk about. So we talked about rights and... Then we talked about a little bit about divorce, but we didn't talk so much about step parents and the difficulties that come up for step parents more often than they come up for intact Mm -hmm. families. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about the challenges of having a stepfather or a stepmother and what the difference is maybe between the challenges between a stepfather and a stepmother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we um, there's a lot of books out there on blended families and like there's a lot of mm-hmm. books directed at adults and how to make it work for adults and what you need to do. And I think that that's great because family breakdown is rampant And we do want to move into those situations as much as possible, trying to redeem or restore. Um, But what we do at Them Before Us is we always look at it from the child's perspective. And so we begin the book defining what rights are. Why do children actually have a right to their mother and father? Because these days, rights language is so overused. I mean, these days, anything an adult really, really wants is conveniently framed as a right. And so we sort of walk through the argument for natural law and natural rights according to natural law and make the case that children have a natural right to their mother and father. So that's chapter one. Chapter two is probably the most important chapter in the entire book. And it's why biology matters in the parent-child relationship. And this is foundational, right? These These are the truths that will not change regardless of what laws we pass, what kind of cultural narratives that we have about marriage and family, and what kind of technology we create and employ to produce children. And so why is it that biology matters in the parent-child relationship? And then that will help us to look at it from the perspective of, well, what about a blended family? What about a step family? Um, And biology matters for three reasons. Um, Number one, it matters because children can only get access to their biological identity from both of their biological parents. And, you know, as an adoptive mom, as somebody who worked at the largest Chinese adoption agency in the world, and now has gathered the stories of 
dozens of children created through third party reproduction. Many of these kids were raised in loving mother father homes, loving stable mother father homes. And yet the vast majority still have questions about the two people responsible for their existence, because that is one of the most universal human longings that we've seen expressed, right? From ancient times to today, you've got art, novels, movies, you know, back, you know, from Shakespeare's Pericles all the way to like Guardians of the Galaxy 2, you have the quest for who is my father? Um, because people, it's very hard to answer the question, who am I? when you cannot answer the question, whose am I? And so we see a longing, even among adopted children and children created through third party reproduction, even if they were raised by a mother and a father, to know the biological identity of the people that made them because it tells them something about their own identity. So this is one of the major reasons why adoption in the United States 60 years ago was overwhelmingly closed. There was no identifying information about the parents given to the child. It was even advised, don't even tell the kid they're adopted. They literally don't need to know. It, biology doesn't matter at all. And now today, 95% of adoptions in the United States are open adoptions where the child has some degree of knowledge or contact with their first family because social workers, have recognized that children benefit from as many connections with their first family as possible, even if they can't be raised by them. So first, biology matters because it helps children answer the question, who am I? And only a child's biological parents can do that. Second, the reason why biology matters in the parent-child relationship is because we have been studying family structure for decades. And what we see is biological parents advantage children in ways that unrelated adults do not. Specifically, they're more connected to their kids, they're more invested in terms of time, energy, and money, and they're more protective of children. And this is something that um, is easily verifiable. Of course, we've got the very best studies, highest level scholarship testifying to this reality in chapter two. But you guys can kind of fact check me in real time right now. Um, as you're listening to this podcast, by Googling the words mother's boyfriend, okay? Because what our culture tells us is that if the adults are happy, the kids will be happy. And two parents are what matters, right? And if there's any man and any woman, the kid's going to have their needs met. Well, if that's the case, children living with their mother and her cohabiting boyfriend would be doing great, but if any of you guys took me up on that challenge of Googling mother's boyfriend, right now you are horrified because you are looking at hundreds of thousands of returns in your search results that detail the most graphic cases of child abuse and child filicide that you are going to find anywhere on the internet. Because what we see is unrelated adults, especially unrelated men living with children are statistically the most dangerous person in a child's life. Why? Because biology confers a level of protectiveness that simply intending to parent or simply having a relationship with the child's parent cannot replicate. And so, you know, we have this sort of cultural mantra that biology doesn't matter. Kids just need to be safe and loved. But the reality is that because kids need to be safe and loved, biology matters greatly. And then finally, um, biology matters because if you're honoring a child's right to be known and loved by both biological parents, you automatically get both halves of humanity represented in the child's life every day, all day, and the developmental benefits that come from that. So if we circle back to your step-parent question, the answer is there are heroic step-parents out there. I personally know mm -hmm. step-parents who have stepped into the gap, gap left by a negligent biological parent, those stepmothers and stepfathers deserve our affirmation and our praise. But on the whole, statistically, children who are raised by a mother and stepfather fare about as well as children raised by a lone mother, which is to say, not very well. So um, step families have a, stepmothers and fathers have a great challenge in front of them which is willfully seeking to overcome um, 
whatever, whether by evolutionary biology means or sinful human nature means has placed on them that they will naturally gravitate towards their own biological children and um, not give the same level of attention, care and protection to unrelated children in their home. The one thing that I thought of was that when Michaela was a teenager and she needed an ankle and a hip replacement, we walked across a street in downtown Toronto, not a really, really busy street, but somebody was turning onto that street. And I stopped in the middle of the street without thinking that I was stopping. I stopped to protect her, you know, without my bo my body, my whoever I am, my mother, me as mother stopped there so that the car would hit me first. Yeah. Now that's, that's a biological move. Yeah. I imagine. I'm not sure, but I imagine it. Well, is. it definitely stems from, you know, the, it definitely has biological origins. We can create connection with children, right? We can create connection with unrelated mm -hmm. children. And as an adoptive mom, I was very purposeful about doing all kinds of things that would um, elevate my connectedness with my son, who was almost two. So we really missed, we really, really missed that critical window of bonding and attachment. But I scheduled <laughs> three times a day eye contact as much as possible. I, you know, would mm -hmm. open my shirt so that his face could be right here so we could get as much oxytocin um benefit both of us um you know but it's hard like we were working against um the bio we were working against biological design which for him um is it's very hard for kids to suddenly transfer allegiance to an unrelated adult right and this is a, this is true even for infants right so this is a very critical point when we're talking about things like surrogacy where we just expect that kids are like a magnet you can pull the the negatives and positives away and then just reattach them to something else. That is not how human children work. And that's not how human adults work either. So you have to recognize the, the biological reality. And then for adoptive parents or step parents actively, honestly, sometimes by the skin of your teeth or the act of, you know, you know, the force of your will seek to connect with them and build those bonds um, outside of the benefit of the biological connection. So what if the mother can't bear a child, so she has uh, an egg and her husband's sperm and that embryo implanted in her and then has the baby? Now, is now how is that? <laughs> it's complicated because she's not the biological mother, but she bears the child. Have you, and have you seen that as that? Uh, is that connection by more yeah. biological? We have seen it all because that's the thing about reproductive technologies is it is a wild west. You can, it, yeah. if you can assemble sperm, egg and womb in any way that you are able to, um, big fertility will hand that baby over to you, regardless of a uh, complete genetic connection or zero genetic connection. And so we make the- So what happens if you carry a baby and bear the baby, but it has, it has virtually no genetic similarity to, there's no yeah. overlap. We have, a, what kind of a connection do you have then when, when that baby well, is born? Well, you have the benefit of the maternal bond. That's what you have, right? You do. So you have the benefit yeah. of the maternal bond and the baby has the benefit of bonding with the mother. The baby has no idea mm -hmm. that they're not genetically related to the woman that's carrying them, right? That woman is the only woman that the baby yeah. knows. But later on in life, what we know through surveys of children created through sperm donation or egg donation, I say donation because this is not a benevolent nonprofit. Nobody's donating anything. No, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. It's not something that they called a oh. donation. See, that's marketing. marketing. Yeah? That's marketing. This is a marketplace. Boy. Everybody's buying and selling. Everybody is buying yeah. and selling. So what we see from children yeah. created through third-party reproduction is many of them grow up to wonder at minimum or agonize often over their missing biological connection. Right. 
And so Mm -hmm. all of chapter seven in our book details, we probably have 30 stories of kids created through sperm or egg donation. Oh my goodness. I read those and it was just yeah, crazy. It, it guts the, you. the stories that you. Yeah. It just, it guts you because yeah. these children have been manufactured and it's different from, you know, in chapter nine, we talk about adoption and we contrast adoption as an institution centered around the well-being of children and big fertility as a marketplace mm-hmm. centered around the desires of adults. And both of these demographics experience parental loss. Right. Both of them have experienced the loss Mm -hmm. of one or two people to whom they have a natural right. And yet the adoptees fare better than the kids create. How much we only have one study that shows that contrast, you know, this is the first time our species is making babies in a laboratory. You would think that there would be more studies done on how they fare and the kind of outcomes, but there's very little oversight, very little tracking. And it's very hard to study this demographic because many of the kids created through these technologies don't know that they belong in the study, right? So it's, there's a lot of challenges mm-hmm. to getting good data on this. But there was one study that was done that contrasted children, adoptees who were raised by neither biological parent and children created through sperm donation who were at least being raised by their biological mother. And those, the kids who were, for example, created through sperm donation, who still had one biological parent, connection with half of their genealogical heritage. The adoptees had zero connection with their genealogical heritage. The kids created through sperm donation were almost twice as likely to say, I feel sad when I see somebody else with their biological family, right? The children created through sperm donation were more Mm -hmm. likely to struggle with substance abuse. They were much more likely to see the dissolution of their parents' relationship if they were in a, in a relationship. Um, they had higher levels of distrust for their parents. And why is that? Because the adoptees mm-hmm. are being raised by people who are seeking to mend the wound that they suffered. And children created through third-party reproduction are being raised by the people who inflicted that wound. And so psychologically, there's a huge burden on the kids, both of them are going to mourn, have questions, um, long to know the identity of the people that gave them life, but the adoptees are going to be talking with the people who are in it with them and trying to help shepherd them. The people created through sperm and egg donation are talking to the people that chose for their parent to be missing. So that means that these kids very often have to process, suffer and grieve alone. And I think that's at the heart of the diminished outcomes for that group of people. Um, Because in this. Have you seen, have you, have you seen any, um, any situations where there was a, an egg donor or a sperm donor and they were active in the child's life. And so, so now maybe instead of two parents, there's three parents because the donor is also the donor is also uh, yeah. Present. So that those arrangements absolutely do happen. Um, and now I think they're more. I think they they never used to, but they're starting to. Are people starting? Well, now to do what that? you've got is the um, emergence of like reproductive apps that will allow you to say, uh, "This is what I'm after." Right? I want a known donor. Or I want an unknown donor. I want somebody who's willing to be involved. I want somebody that has nothing to do with the child. And so you can create all these different arrangements. Generally, those have not been preferred because out of fear that if that donor is involved in the life of the child, they could claim parental rights, which they can because they're the biological parent of the child. So that's one thing that them before us fights against is we have all of there's all this legislation coming up saying biology is irrelevant to whether or not that baby belongs to you. It's simply who has signed the dotted line of the contract contractually the that is what determines parenthood. But the reality is for the child, right? You look at kids and the results of, of kids who have been created through sperm and egg donation and the surveys will say, half of the kids will say, that's not some donor or stranger. That is my biological parent. And that's what I mean. Like there are these child realities that are going to persist regardless of what our laws say, regardless of what kind of cultural narratives we have around marriage and family. Children come from a man and woman. They long to be known by that man and woman and our laws, you will never be able to legislate away a child's longing to be known by both mother and father. 
So, um, yeah, there's all kinds of, like I said, it's a wild west. You can find everything out there in terms of these um, novel family arrangements, but all of them have something in common. Um, all of these forms of modern family have something in common, and that is they're all built on child loss. All of them require the child to lose part or all of a relationship with one or both parents for the kid to be in that family. So that's an injustice, you know? Tragedy has been a part of the human experience when it comes to family since the beginning of humanity in terms of tragic mother or father mm -hmm. loss. But we used to mourn. Today, you know, mm -hmm. we are inflicting those losses intentionally and calling it progress. Right, right, right. Yeah, because, you know, men got killed yeah. in war often, which isn't as often anymore. But now there's a different loss that's happening. Yep. And we're not, but we're not calling it the same thing. They used to be lost in battle or killed in battle. Well, then you would mourn the loss of your yep. father. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, the whole rites of passage that we used to have to become a man, uh, and I'm, there's still that happens in some societies, not in our society anymore. That's a loss. That's a loss. And th that's a loss that the people who are maturing mm -hmm. have lost. And you know, has any of that come back? Well, now I'm going to like put my mom hat on because I was just talking with my 15 year old son about this um, because he's talking about what he wants to do. And um, it's really sweet. You know, he really he talks about getting married early, young. Um, he talks about his career aspirations. And part of the reasons why he has sort of the career path that he has is because he recognizes that he would have to take care of a wife. And um, that's it. Like marriage is the last rite of passage that we have for young men today. Right. Yeah. And right. It's actually, it should be jarringly um, alarming that marriage is passing away as um, very few men, fewer and fewer men and women are getting married. And if you want mature men, you will not get them without these rites of passage. And marriage is the only one we've got left, right? You don't become mature until you take responsibility for someone else. So motherhood tends to do that for women. Yeah. Marriage tends to do that for men. And, um, and it's bad. It's bad for men, right? persistently, you know, living in a Peter Pan state where you don't have to protect and provide any for anybody else. That's not, that's bad for men. It's bad for women who would love to be nurtured and cared for and um, have a connected father for their child, but it's bad for men too. Yeah. And, and there's evidence that shows if uh, a woman and a man live together, they're more likely to this, split up than if they are married. Correct. So we, the statistics yeah, we are have um, a section on cohabitation in chapter four because there's a lot of obviously um, drama and um, novelty around same sex relationships or throuples or um, some of these dystopic arrangements for third party reproduction. But when you're looking at the sheer numbers um, when it comes to risks and threat to children, cohabitation is at the top, right? These kids are. Um, four times more likely to live in poverty, four times to experience abuse and neglect, three times more likely to see the dissolution of their parents' relationship. Um, cohabitation is not a marriage equivalent. It will not do, it cannot do what marriage does for the adults or the child. Um, and it's, it's, it's a tragedy that in the minds of young people, they think that um, this is just like marriage or even that it's like a test drive for a car to see if it works. No, no, you're gonna wreck the car. You're going to get in the car, you're going to wreck it. And then if you want to own it permanently, then you have to figure out how to rebuild it and re and re you know, refurbish it. No, like people are not cars. We don't test drive them. We commit to them. Um, and then we watch both of us grow and learn um, through that unwavering commitment that brings a kind of security for the adults and the children that cohabitation never will. Yeah. No, when I was, uh, before I was married, I lived for a little while with my fiance. And when we married, it was different. 
it was amazingly different. It was different because I brought my mom and dad to the marriage and so did he. So everything that we had grown up with and thought of as marriage, we brought to the marriage and then had to negotiate forward on our Mm -hmm. own behalf. But you, if you don't get married, you never go that extra step and become a married couple. And what you just said identifies two main differences between cohabitation and marriage. Number one is marriage is symmetrical. Both people say, I'm going to give you my entire life, all my life till death do us part. The other one says, I'm going to give you my entire life, all my life till death do us part. It's an equal commitment on behalf of both. Cohabiting relationships are usually asymmetrical, right? She's thinking, I really want this guy to propose to me. I hope this leads to marriage. He's thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so glad this woman's just, she's washing my underwear. This is amazing, right? Like there's an unequal level of commitment there. And then also the way that couples make decisions is different. So um, we quote a guy named Scott Stanley in the book that talks about the decision-making uh, process for cohabiting couples tends to be what he calls sliding. They slide into, oh, I guess we're having kids now. Oh, well, I guess... You know, we're mm-hmm. going to, you know, move to this new place or whatever. Married couples decide. Married couples say, okay, once you graduate from your um, program, then we're going to have kids. Or, okay, since we're in this in life together, you need to move. So I will prepare so that we can move together. So there's a sliding for decision making that happens with happening couples. Mm-hmm. And there's a deciding with married couples, right? Because like you said, you have to negotiate because no one's going anywhere, right? No one is going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And that changes the decision-making process. And you're both in 100%, which means you're much more likely to be looking out for the other person's best interest versus the cohabiting couple where if it gets too hard, they're like, bye. <laughs> There's always a back door. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. The sliding. I never thought of that. I like that. So... It was interesting, your idea of adoption being Mm -hmm. preferable. And and that now there are open policies for adoption. So then little kids can, when they grow up, they can know who their biological mother was. Often not the father, though, I would imagine, in adoption. But yeah, often not the father, that's for sure. And... uh, you know, just in terms of, you know, because we have, we have just diseases, you know, in our family. How do you figure out where this came from if you don't have the genetics of one, even just one side of your family? That has... You don't know? Yeah. That's hard. That has probably been the most universal objection among children created through donor conception, that they don't have medical records, right? No yeah. medical records. I, that, I would be yeah. sunk. I think I'd be sunk. I know I'd be sunk by and now. And, you know, just to kind of zoom out and kind of do big idea, big framing, why is adoption different? Why is it different? Um, and the guiding principle mm-hmm. at them before us is that adults need to do hard things on behalf of children instead of insisting that children do hard things on behalf of adults. So adoption is an institution that actually is absolutely set up around insisting that adults do hard things so the needs of children are met. And it's hard, right? It's hard in terms of all of the background checks and the vetting and the screening and the medical clearances and the financial records and all of that, it's hard. But it's also hard in terms of taking on the emotional load of a child that has experienced significant brokenness, right? So it's the adults accepting hardship on behalf of the child. So that's sort of the cheat sheet when you're looking at marriage and family situations. Who's doing the hard thing? In reproductive technologies, it's always insisting the kids do hard things on behalf of adults. It's always the kid needs to lose a parent so that I can have what I want. And a lot of times what parents want are natural and good, like it's good to want children, but it can never be at the expense of a child's fundamental rights. So now looking at adoption, right? Like you said, it is challenging on a lot of levels to raise a child that's not biologically connected to you. One of them is what you said, medical history. So in the United States today, 
whenever possible in open adoptions, especially open domestic adoptions, a lot of times those medical records are available, which is good. And ending anonymity, there's been progress among donor conceived child groups to completely end anonymity and insist that if donor conception takes place, it's open ID and that medical, basic medical records are given to the children and they have access to them from day one, right? But that's not mm -hmm. the only concern when it comes to raising adopted children or um, kids who are conceived through third party reproduction. Um, part of it is like you can see yourself in your biological children, right? I mean, one of my kids is a carbon copy of me. Like people look at her and they're like, I don't know you, but I know your mother. Like we are, <laughs> we are so similar. Um, and my other two biological kids, I can see aspects of myself in them, even though they favor their father. Our youngest, our adopted son doesn't have that benefit. And it's hard. Honestly, it's hard on him to be the one that's unlike the rest of us. Um, he belongs with us. I, he was hand selected for us by the hand of God. And he is a Faust through and through, but I will tell you that I cannot fully compensate for everything that he has lost. You know, we love him. We're committed to him legally, according to the government of the United States and China, he is just as much our child as our biological children, but he has some additional challenges navigating his world and his identity because he can't look at me or my husband and say, that's where I got it, or I get this from dad, or I get this from mom. Um, and I think that we understate how important that is for identity consolidation in children um, because he is going to have to formulate his identity outside of um, some of the things that historically humans have mapped themselves along to get to the end route of this is who I am. So um, adoption is redemptive, but it's redemptive because it begins with loss. And we, at them before us, we don't ever minimize that. You know, we recognize it um, and then encourage adults to do what they can to seek to mend that loss. Yeah. So there was one thing that I wanted to talk to you about was that the most, it's important that the heterosexual couple, child centered family is at the center. But that can't be all there is because people don't uh, rise up to the ideal. There's always mistakes that are made. And I want to talk about the fringe and the necessity for the fringe. Because there's experimentation at the fringe and adaptation at the fringe that can't happen if there's just the center. Even immuno immunologically, there has to be experimentation. That's why you can't marry your brother, you know, I mean, you, so you, you need an, an other, even in a intact heterosexual relationship, but it looks like this fringe is necessary. And so I guess what I think you're saying so far is that adoption is the fringe that we think is the safest for the children because there's going to be a fringe. And all this other stuff, though, it's here already. All of this other uh, ways of getting pregnant or, or even, who knows, maybe not even pregnancy anymore, just having a baby b born to you. There's so many ways now. And... So the fringe is getting very large. Anyway, what do you think of well, all of that? Well, you've always had people that were outside. And I actually asked Jordan this because we happen to be sitting next to each other at that meeting. Um, yeah. And so I yeah. asked him like why he chose to use the term center and fringe versus rule and exception. Um, and mm. 
you know, his answer was like the rule based on what the rule or the norm versus the exception. Well, is it the norm of what adults normally do? Um, you know, and the exception to what, because in that sense, like the norm, the exception would be the adults who marry, stay together and commit to one another for life. Um, and so I think that his, um, terminology is really helpful that there is a center, right? This is the central aspect of what we are aiming for, right? This is the goal. This is the ideal. Um, and then there's all kinds of fringe, sometimes based on just human, unchosen human brokenness. Um, but also these days more and more on the fringe because we are misidentifying it as good, right? And so I think that you can recognize that there are people on the fringe um, who can't get pregnant naturally um, or who are have unwanted singleness. You know, they would love to be married, but they haven't found the right person um, or who were divorced against their will or whatever it is that exists. It's always existed. You know, we've all, we always have all throughout history, people who were not able to get into the center. Um, and so we do need to recognize those realities and as much as possible, deal gently and compassionately with people on the fringe. The problem I have seen in all converse, everything, every topic about marriage and family, whether you're talking about people that are seeking a divorce, people with same sex attraction, people with infertility, people who identify as polyamorous, um, people that are in a cohabiting relationship, um, is that we have allowed the emotions of the adults to redefine the center. That's the problem that I see, is now the center, culturally speaking, is whatever makes the adults happy. But then you are destroying the reality of what children need to thrive. And so the center has to be the thing where children don't have to sacrifice anything to be in the center, right? That to me is, is the metric for who gets, who's, who's in the center, who's outside the center. Like the center cannot become, cannot encompass everything that adults long for in marriage and family, because oftentimes what adults long for is going to be at the cost of the fundamental rights and needs of children. So the center has mm -hmm. to be composed of the conditions that lead as much as possible to child thriving. And that is a child's mother and father committed to one another for life. Mm -hmm. And outside of that, there is going to be options. There's going to be options for people because there has to be options for people. And so this isn't about whether those options are necessary or not. This is about what is at the center. And what we're calling the ideal. You know, like we've got all of these narratives that say things like, well, it's a two-parent home or kids just need to be loved. Or if the adults are happy, the kids will be happy, right? If I, if you'd look at the cultural center, to me, that's what the cultural center today is communicating. But that's not the case. Right. Very often, even when the adults are happy, the children are starving of the emotional, developmental and identity connections that they need. Um, so I, I think that when we're talking about the center, well, when I talk about the center, it is one that is child centric. It is one that is focused on the rights and well-being of the child. And like I said, like my default is empathy and love and compassion with people that are outside of the center. Mm -hmm. Like if I was, if I wasn't being an activist, which was not my first choice, that's all I do is walk with people in struggling marriages, mourn with women that are dealing with infertility, like bear the burden of my friends who are who experience same sex attraction or gender confusion and, um, and just need a safe place to dump. Like that's all I want to do. Um, and so I think that we need empathy for people that are outside the center. But if you think that you're going to redefine the center around the desires of adults at the expense of children, that's when you have to go through me. That's when you're, that's when the sacrifice now that now you're in like child sacrifice territory and that's the no go zone. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think that, I think it might even be a relief. I don't know. 
because I'm not in that situation. But I've made my mistakes, so I have to deal with my own sins of my past. And we all have to deal with those things that we've done in our lives. And so you, I think for myself in any way, in order to atone for the things I've done that were um, selfish, uh, it's good to know what you need to atone for. And I, I do believe that uh, the only way through this, because there's just so much multiplicity now of identity and family makeup and everything is so multifaceted now, we need to get, we need to find a center and the center is with, uh, is with our maker. That's why there's that center as well, you know? So there isn't just this center to the family. There's the center of the family, but then the family is centered on something as well. And the family has to be centered on ethics yep. that come from our society, from our history, from our Judeo-Christian background, because that's really genetically, that's who we are. And I know I spent a lot of my younger years thinking that I could just do yoga and I could find my way that way and peace that way and insight that way. And it, and it was good and it was a guiding light for me until crisis hit. And then when crisis hit, and crisis will hit all of us individually, and it'll hit all of us as a family. And you have to have somewhere, something to hold on to, right? You got to have your ship that's, you got to have your ship that's floating in this sea of trouble. And um, it, we have to talk about what makes a ship, what makes a ship, well, the most centered thing the thing that you can find that's closest to the center that's what's going to keep you up yeah i agree amen i love it amen <laughs> it's always nice to talk to you Thanks for having me um I, yeah i hope your podcast i i hope it's going i hope people are enjoying it as much as i do um is there anything else you want to say is there something um, that you want to say well, you started asking a question about surrogacy, and we didn't get there, so we could do that. No, we want. didn't get there. Okay, let's talk the about The way surrogacy. that I try to break it down for people, because there's so much confusion about surrogacy, but even and especially, I'd say, among the right, because we love babies. Um, and I think a lot of us, the image that's conjured up for us is the infertile couple who desperately wants children, and there's no other way that they can have it, and then her sister volunteers to be an altruistic surrogate and there's no money exchanged and blah, 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 right? That's kind of what's going on in our head. Um, we, the way that I explain what surrogacy is, again, from the child's perspective, because if you look at it from the perspective of adults, you could justify and encourage and incentivize all kinds of arrangements. But if you look at it from the child's mm -hmm. perspective, there really is no surrogate arrangement that is going to be child friendly. And the best way to understand that is what surrogacy does is it splices what should be one woman, mother, into three purchasable and optional women, right? So you have the genetic mother, which is the egg donor, right? Which is what you were talking about before. Like, what if that's missing? Well, if that's missing, then you get the genealogical bewilderment. Um, you get the identity questions, right? The second one is the birth mother, and that's the surrogate, right? Very often there's no genetic connection between the surrogate and the baby because we've spliced these two different women, which is preferable, right? It's preferable for a single man or for two men to split that up because then when the child longs to know who their mother is, who do they even, who do they even seek, right? When an adoptee wants to know mm -hmm. who their mother is, that one person is going to be the genetic mother and the birth mother. When a child created through surrogacy wants to know who their mother is, the answer is you kind of don't have one. We've kind of 
the concept Oof, for you, wow. right? There is no mother. We've split mm-hmm. them up. And so really, why bother, right? And then the third one is the social mother, right? The woman who is the maternal female presence in the child's life every day, right? The woman who has higher levels of oxytocin, which makes her the parent that gravitates more towards caregiving and nurture than the male parent who has higher levels of vasopressin, which is more aggressive and protective. Still a great hormone, very different from what mothers do. That's The social mother is the one who naturally simplifies her words right down to the child's level versus the male parent who talks to the child just like he talks to everybody else in big grown-up adult words, right? The, the social mother is the one who is going to be honing the child's fine motor skills through all the caregiving activities like you know, chopping vegetables or tying shoes or cutting or drawing, um, as opposed to the father who emphasizes gross motor skills through running and jumping and climbing, right? So from the child's perspective, you know, what this woman gives the child half of their biological identity. This woman, the birth mother, like we said earlier, the kid may not know that they're not genetically related, but this is the only woman. This is the only person that the child knows on the day that they're born. And you can watch videos, you know, of babies delivered through C-section way over on the side of the room, crying, crying, crying. And then they move the baby over to the mother's face and the mother starts talking to them and the baby immediately calms down because that is the only thing mm-hmm. the baby knows. And, you know, we just think, oh, well, you can just hoist that baby onto whatever shirtless man or shirtless woman and boom, the baby will start bonding. Well, yeah, they'll start, but they're at a nine and a half month disadvantage, right? You have actually removed from mm-hmm. the child the only the only frame of reference they have for, the, you know, there's this developmental phase when children are, I think it's like, six to nine months where the child does not know that they are not the mother, right? They literally think, they look at the mom so much, they think that's who I am. And so when the mother leaves the room, they freak out because they're like, I'm gone. I have left the room because there's such a close connection with mother and baby. Think about how much closer that is when the baby is literally inside the woman. They cannot distinguish the mother from themselves, right? So that bond is so critical. It is the foundation of trust and attachment um, that the child is going to take into the rest of their life, right? So what surrogacy does is it says, here's these three moms. Which one do you have? Which one do you need? Which one do you need to pay for, right? Do you have a womb and you're gonna be the social mother? You just need to purchase the egg? No problem. Or do you have an egg and you're gonna raise the baby yourself? You just need to rent a womb. Great. Well, we can we can arrange that for you for a cool, you know, hundred thousand dollars or whatever. Or you're going to purchase the egg from a catalog. You're going to rent the womb. Um, maybe if you need a discount, you're going to go overseas and find a brown womb because you know the white wombs here in the United States are a little more expensive. And then you're not going to raise the baby with a social mother at all. Okay, great. Right? How much money do you have? And so, from a child's perspective, none of these three mothers are optional. The child needs all three. The child is made for all three. And anytime you separate these women into different people, the child is going to experience loss. If the, if this one role is not found in one woman, the child is going to experience loss. Now, sometimes, like we talked about, that's unavoidable because we live in a fallen world and there is tragedy. And so we seek to mend that loss in whatever way that we can. And adoption grafting that child into a family that has been screened, vetted, and background checked so that they can, as much as possible, provide the level of care that a biological parent would, sometimes that's the best option. But surrogacy intentionally separates and inflicts maternal loss on the child for the sake of profit. So surrogacy is just not child-friendly. It's not about babies. When you look at what's going on in the world of surrogacy, it's more accurate to say that surrogacy is about on-demand designer babies shipped worldwide. And if this is all new, and this is the first time you're hearing this, all of chapter eight in our book is about surrogacy and the experiences of children created through these technologies and how it's absolutely at the basement of repulsive practices that you could inflict on the child. Yeah, that, that, 
that chapter was harrowing to read, <laughs> I would say. I know it's yeah. a little heavy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's a bit heavy, but that's, that's, hey, we're talking about the great mother here. And the great mother, she's nothing to sneeze at because she will take you out. You know, she'll raise you up, but she'll take you out. And so if we don't talk about it, she'll take you out anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like there's no avoiding Well, and I this. think like when you're looking down the road, you know, people are like, well, it's all just getting worse. I'm like, yeah, it is. It is. Like in all the three areas that I think have in essence turned children into accessories, right? Whether it's the cultural changes, the legal changes or the technological changes, none of these are really heading in the right direction. But natural law, right, that children come from a man and woman, that they have a right to that man and woman, that they benefit from being raised by that man and woman, natural law cannot remain hidden. It will make itself manifest, right? You are not going to be able to redefine mm. the nature of the child. At some point, we are going to have to see it and address it and then hopefully course correct as a result. Um, but right now, you know, adults are in the spotlight, what they want, their sexual desires, feelings, longings, right? Right now that is God in our culture and um, whatever is your God, you will sacrifice for. And when sex is God, children are always the required sacrifice. So I hope that we get to the place where we can see children for who they are, understand their natural rights, understand that, and this is, you know, where I'm so grateful to be a part of ARC because they're, their emphasis is voluntary adoption of responsibility. And that is the only way out of the mess of marriage and family is the voluntary adoption of responsibility by anybody that creates a child. You have a responsibility to that kid. Nobody, nobody is going to be able to give that child what you can. You cannot swap yourself out of that equation and have your child be unaffected if you make a baby. They deserve you. They need you. They have a right to you. And there are things that you can give them that no other adult can give them. So it means that adults have to do hard things, every adult. And that's, you know, I said at the first dinner um, at the ARC meeting in London, I said, we defend children's rights to their mother and father, which means that at some point I will piss you off too. Like this is a mission that insists that all adults sacrifice no adult gets a pass. Mm -hmm. Every adult has to do hard things. And it's at that point when we are really going to be able to turn the ship around. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, as soon, I think as soon as the pill was uh, manufactured, then uh, the rights of the mother who w would be the mother were put before the child. So that was the first, you know, there's always been condoms and there's always been different ways that women could try to get away with not having children. But, you know, there's the rhythm method and all of that. And, uh, hey, you know, we're human. We can think up anything. So, uh, the the pill we've never talked about the pill we've never talked about what it what it did to women and how it changed their choices how it changed uh what men they were going to choose for husbands um how long they were going to put off having children and what that means we never we have never talked about all of that and so all of this surrogacy and all, really the surrogacy a lot of that i think comes from the birth control pill. So women have put off having children so long in their, so they're now 35 and now they can't get pregnant on their own. Oh, well, we have an industry who will take care of that. Uh, so we like the, so that's uh, also part of this conversation is the birth yeah. control pill and the birth control pill is a hormone. And now we're giving hormones, estrogen and, and testosterone to girls and boys, like, well, women have been taking hormones. Well, so can girls and boys. It's like, no, no, we haven't, we haven't talked about it enough. So 
I'm very grateful to you for talking about this part of it, the family. Uh, we need to talk about all of this. I have another podcast. Uh, Dr. Sarah Hill wrote a book called Your Brain on oh, the Breath Control Pill. I, I have a podcast on that. She talks about the birth control pill. We talk about that. And I've been waiting for that book for a long time and someone to talk to about it. And, uh, yeah, you know, and I think girls actually, I've heard that girls are making decisions not to use the birth control pill now more than they did. But what does that mean about all the rest of it, you know, are, are people still getting married? Well, no, they're not getting married. And are they having kids before they're 25? No, they're not, which is the best time to have a child. I so love that, we got to talk I love about that all you brought stuff. up the pill because what that did is it separated sex from babies, right? It cut the connection between sex yeah. and diapers. And so conceptually, mm -hmm. what that means is like, I'm the boss of this. I am the boss of when children come in and out of the world, right? So that same mentality goes into the industry that separates sex from babies, right? Babies from sex, right? It separates yeah. from sex. Now you can have babies yeah. without sex. Like birth control said you can have sex without babies. Big fertility says you can have babies without sex. And it's the same kind of mentality. And, you know, I often make the comparison between abortion and big fertility, right? Abortion says both industries determine the rights of children based on the wants of adults. So abortion says, mm -hmm. if a child is unwanted, I can violate their right to life and force them out of existence. And big fertility says, if a child is very wanted, I can violate their right to their mother and father and force them into existence, right? Both of them, it's mm -hmm. like two sides of the same child commodifying coin, where we are looking at children as objects of rights, right? I have a right to this. I have a right to eliminate it and I have a right to force it into existence. And what we're trying to do at them before us, this is say, no, children are not objects of rights. They are subjects of rights. They have rights. And because they are the most vulnerable person in this equation, it is the powerful that must conform to their rights versus forcing the weak to sacrifice for the strong. But I, you are exactly mm -hmm. right that all these technologies, right, have actually diminished our concept of the child, who they are, what they need, what they deserve, what they have a right to. And it, and it didn't just come out of nowhere with big fertility. No, that's for sure. Yeah. Yep. we got to wake up. Yep, we do. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Post. Just a joy to see your face. Yeah, it's nice that yes. we got to chat Thanks finally. Thanks for making it work.